Hello and welcome to the Mutual Fund Show. My name is Neeraj Shah and over the next two episodes, we'll try and talk about uh, funds which have been rank out performers across different categories. So, uh, and largely on the equity side because that's where uh, I think the real outperformance are shown in different categories. So we've chosen the multi-cap category, uh, which is what we'll do today. Talk about the multi-cap funds and two or three of those funds, houses, did extremely well on the multi-cap products. There was Access, which did well. There is PPFS, which did well. And we thought, it's why not get the guy behind the outperformance of this fund, get into the belly of the fund and try and figure out what is it that they have done, why is it that they have shown the kind of performance that they have shown, and what is it that they believe could happen in 2020 so that if you are invested in this fund, you would know what to expect from this fund in an informed fashion for 2020. Rajiv Thakkar, and Director and Chief Investment Officer at PPFS Mutual Fund joins us right now on the show to talk about their flagship scheme, which incidentally has been amongst the best performers in the multi-cap category. Rajiv, congratulations. Well done. Thank you uh, so much. Can you tell our viewers a bit about your fund? Some of them are invested and know, uh, but a lot of them might not know what exactly does your fund do. I, I presume, I mean, uh, we, let's start off with the fact that it's a multi-cap fund, but can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure. So, as you mentioned, it's our flagship fund. and. In 2013, when we launched, we said we want a simple product for the investors which can invest across market cap, across sectors, and across geography. We didn't want to confuse investors with uh, flavor of the month kind of mutual fund schemes where every month you have some new launch or the other coming up. Uh, we had a situation which was threatening to uh, be like this, where the number of equity schemes would be more than the number of investable stocks in <laughs> India if SEBI had not come out with the categorization of uh, mutual fund schemes. So uh, rather than telling the investor buy a large cap fund now or buy a small cap fund now, the fund itself can take those calls and even uh, it's a well known fact that different countries go through different cycles and have performance over different time frames. For example, the period 2000 to 2010 was India's decade. Uh, 2010 to 2020, US has done much better than India. So having a mix of investments across geographies helps in reducing the volatility of the scheme as well as uh, potentially enables outperformance when one particular market is not doing that well. So a mix of all these factors helped us do well. Okay, so essentially your fund, first talking about your fund, you invest across market caps, so across sizes, yes. and you invest across geographies as well. So yes. India is X percentage, and global equities are X percentage. Are they limited to particular geographies or do you invest worldwide? Yes. Uh, so minimum 65% of the fund's corpus is invested in India. Minimum. Minimum. Mm -hmm. What this does is it classifies the scheme as an Indian equity fund. Mm -hmm. uh, this scheme becomes long-term investment after one year of holding and it's tax rate beneficial rates of 10% uh, after a one year holding. Up to 35% can be invested across the world, but largely we are restricting ourselves to North America, Western Europe and developed Asia kind of thing. So we are not going into exotic countries. We are sticking ourselves, uh, restricting ourselves to uh, global multinationals, well-known companies which the investors would generally be familiar with. Okay, so you invest directly into these companies and not That's via correct. a fund of fund structure. That is correct. Okay, just if I, out of curiosity, may I ask, uh, a lot of people find it difficult to just track companies within a particular geography that they are in as well. Uh, how do you get the confidence that you'll be able to pick the right stocks um, in these global geographies, I mean, the U.S. itself is such a large market, but you do U.S. in addition to India, and as I heard you say, Western Europe and some parts of Africa, or not Asia. Asia, Asia, Asia as well. How do you get the confidence that you'll be able to go out and pick the winners in that segment? 35% is also a fairly large uh, prof percentage of money going. True, Neeraj. So today, whether we like it or not, and even if one is a pure Indian investor, one has to be a global analyst in one way or the other. And I'll tell you why. If you are analyzing, let's say, ONGC, the profits of ONGC depend on global crude prices. Hmm. And ONGC is not that different from, let's say, ExxonMobil or a Saudi Aramco in that sense. If you are analyzing Wipro Infosys TCS, 
the analysts covering these companies hmm. are anyway looking at Accenture and Cognizant in the US. Hmm. Pharma, uh, generic pharma is a global play, it's not an Indian play. Uh, a Tata Motors depends on Jaguar Land Rover more than their India operations. So sector after sector, company after company, these things play out. So our research is structured on sectoral lines. Uh, the sector analyst in India looks at the Indian companies as well as global companies. And that enables us to arrive at uh, some conclusion about the valuations and the business aspects. We don't go to very niche businesses. Uh, so uh, some company which has only US operations and which, are, which is in the sector which is not familiar to us, we would stay away from such businesses. Okay. These are, as I mentioned, let's say if you are looking at Nestle, uh, the Nestle parent company versus Nestle in India is not that different a company. And since Nestle has global operations, uh, whether you are sitting in Switzerland or in US or in India, everyone is at the same advantage, disadvantage as far as analyzing Nestle goes. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the other question uh, is, Rajiv, that uh, when, when I'm, so l let's say you, you, you mentioned that 35 percent is on the on the global shares and 65 minimum 65 percent is in India. I hear, I mean, for example, the the question that we ask a lot of global investors as well as the sell side global guys who are asking investors to come to India, is that they want to come to an emerging market like India because growth out here is much higher. Are you saying that? Despite the plethora of opportunities available here, there are companies on the global front which might actually give you higher growth, with the presumption that you invest for growth at a reasonable price. They'll give you higher growth than what is available in India, or is geographical diverse, diversification the key reason why you're doing this? So uh, you have asked a wonderful question, and there are two or three points here. Firstly, the growth of a particular company depends on the maturity of that particular sector hmm. and the size of opportunity rather than the uh, geography, geography that uh, that company is. <coughs> so I mentioned ONGC earlier. Now the growth of ONGC would depend on how many oil wells they can drill successfully and what production increase they, they can do. Uh, with, uh, and it has nothing to do with India's GDP growth rate. Again, a lot of the new age sectors where Indians are participating as consumers are not in the listed space in India. So for example, we don't have a, a cell phone company listed in India. Uh, the Xiaomi's and the Apple's and Samsung's of the world are listed outside of India. E-commerce, you don't have meaningful listed companies in India. Amazon is listed globally. Walmart, which owns Flipkart, is a global company. Google, Facebook are Google uh, global companies. So a lot of these companies are having growth rates of 20%, 25%. So it's not necessary that every Indian company is a fast-growing company and every US company is a slow-growing company. That is one. Secondly, people have this thing that India is an emerging market country, so India's returns will be better than global returns, which is not true for last one year, three year, five year, 10 year returns. So, the decade of 2010 to the 2020 has been more of an American decade than an Indian decade. Yeah, I think uh, and there are enough examples probably, right? I mean, Google versus Nifty in INR terms, and I think there is ample justification out there that a large global company could at times do as well or maybe even better than an emerging market economy as well. Yes. Um, would you want to dwell on that a bit? And, and then I have a follow-up question on your bottom-up style of stock picking too. Sure, so one is when people compare returns across geographies, what people miss out on is that the Indian rupee typically depreciates about four, four and a half percent per year. So you cannot compare rupee returns directly with dollar returns. Either compare both returns in dollar terms or compare both returns in rupee terms. When you do that, the US S&P 500 has done much better than Nifty in India over, as I mentioned, one, three, five and 10 years. And uh, the tech companies have done much better than the S&P 500. So obviously NASDAQ has done much better than the S&P 500. And the other uh, thing that people normally think about, and wrongly so, 
is that all these companies would be very expensive. So people would think that, oh, uh, the Googles and Facebooks of the world would be in bubble territory and this is the second version of dot-com boom. Actually, these companies which are growing at around 28 times are about 25 times earnings. So it's not that they are very expensive, especially when we compare them with the uh, FMCG kind of mm -hmm. valuations in India. They are growing at faster levels and valued cheaper than many of the Indian companies. Okay, so is that the reason why you look at these bottom-up style? Because I'm guessing that your portfolio would therefore, and correct me if I'm wrong, not mirror any key benchmark in that sense, sectoral terms or otherwise. I mean, a lot of people benchmark their Indian portfolios to, let's say, the 40% weightage that financials have, and therefore they are near about their 35 to 42, 43%, and try and keep it that way. You would not be doing that, and and maybe with reason because you've seen in your uh, uh, opinion, I mean, the like your largest holding is HDFC Bank, and the kind of returns that that has given vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark, or a mid-sized company like Bajaj Holdings and the kind of returns that that has given vis-a-vis -vis the benchmarks or the markets, are testimony to the fact that it may not necessarily pay to mirror the indices. That is correct, Neeraj. So we are neither contrarians nor consensus-driven people. We are bottom-up stock pickers. Hmm. So uh, HDFC Bank may look like a complete consensus stock pick where HDFC Bank is the top pick for a lot of mutual fund schemes and it's one of the large holdings for, even for us. At the same time, uh, something like a Bajaj holding does not figure in anyone's uh, portfolios, whereas we have held Bajaj holding and Maharashtra scooter for uh, a very, very uh, long time. And uh, again, we would be buying some of the uh, small and mid-cap companies, things like Zydus Wellness or uh, companies like that. So uh, we'll evaluate each company on its own merits and we are not driven by whether a stock is in the index or out of it and what are other people doing with the stock. So would, would it be fair to assume that the pattern of your buying is not necessarily based on what is necessarily the trend right now? You would really look at a long-term picture and therefore, uh, even though mutual funds shouldn't be analyzed that way, they do get analyzed, I mean, for example, on a yearly basis as well, that how much the NAV has moved for a one-year period and not necessarily one, two, three months. Would the pattern of your buying, just so that your investors and, you, and the viewers that are watching the show right now know, that your buying would not be uh, necessarily from a one-year perspective? Absolutely correct. So uh, in all our communication, we highlight the fact that uh, the scheme is suitable only for people looking at five year plus kind of investment horizons. Uh, very simply, the scheme tends to underperform when Indian markets are doing much better than the global markets. So after the 2014 general elections, uh, we were lagging the uh, Indian market because uh, about 30% was invested overseas. At the same time, any adverse effect on the Indian markets is not fully reflected in the portfolio. So that is the period of outperformance. So a demonetization or a GST would not affect the global uh, component and that would be resilient to the factors affecting the Indian markets. So looking at it from a one year perspective may not be uh, the right thing to do, especially for our scheme. Uh, we look at business trends rather than stock market trends. So when a lot of Advertising is shifting to digital mediums when a lot of uh, retailing is shifting to e-commerce. So we are cognizant of those kind of trends, but we don't look at uh, what is happening to uh, popularity in the stock exchanges or what are other funds doing. That is not a criteria when we look to invest. Okay. So how, have, how has this strategy paid off over the last few years? I think we've got some data of what last the few year performance has been versus the Nifty TRI. Uh, can you tell us um, how and why has that happened and what is the kind of confidence that you have for the next uh, multiple years but also uh, the next year, uh, the current year which is 2020 which promises to be full of events that could determine what the world markets do at large. Uh, so as I mentioned on a year to year basis performance can be either higher than the Nifty TRI, uh, uh, Nifty 500 TRI or lower than that. Uh, 2017, when the broader markets were doing very, very well and 
uh, where it was a complete small and mid cap driven rally that time we had some amount of liquidity in the fund and again the we were not only in small and mid cap space so we were broadly lagging the uh, nifty tri but that was more than made up in 2018 and 19 uh, as the broader market went into a turmoil and uh, we could do well so depending on the time frame uh, we have done better than the benchmark uh, and the category overall over the last one three and five years okay and would you believe that uh, that's the kind of um, one outperformance that you would uh, be able to continue and in order to do that uh, would you make changes to the standard uh, of your fund in the, in the in the sense what i mean to ask is would you take a higher than 65 percent exposure to india and reduce the global exposure would you take a higher than what is the trend for your fund exposure to mid caps and small caps versus large caps how do you think you would navigate through the next uh, 12 to 24 months so we every active fund has this uh, attempt to do better than the benchmark and to mm. uh, really do well within the category so our attempt will be that but obviously there are no guarantees in a, a market linked product uh, strategy would largely be the same uh, we are looking at uh, a mix of Indian and global companies uh, to have a wider opportunity set as well as to lower the country specific volatility. So unless there is a scenario where foreign stocks are extremely overvalued and Indian stocks are very very attractive, typically this uh, 65, 30 kind of weightage would continue. You don't think that's the case right now? I mean, uh, yes, I, I think, I think uh, in fact, in some cases, foreign stocks are cheaper than comparable Indian stocks. Okay. So at least right now, there's no uh, reason to cut down on the foreign uh, investments. Okay. So that would continue. And weightage to small and mid caps, uh, we are looking at that space. And uh, in fact, the last stock we added was from the small and mid cap space. But uh, it won't be very dramatic shifts. It will be largely driven by the opportunities which come our way. Okay, but this 65% Indian component, uh, if that was to be 100% in, in, uh, of the fund, how much is it, if it in that multi-cap scheme uh, skewed towards large caps? How much if it is mid-cap and small cap? And I presume, as you said, that that will continue. Uh, yes, yeah, so about 65-70% uh, or sometimes close to 80% is in large caps. The remaining uh, typically is in the small and mid cap space. Okay, would you would you change that? I mean, you don't think so that 2020-21 uh, could be the year of broader market could be. performance? So it could be. So we keep looking at the broader market for opportunities and uh, we do invest in uh, stocks which come our way. Uh, but I think somewhere this whole narrative that Oh, small and mid cap space is so beaten out uh, is largely driven by the peak levels seen in 2017. Mm -hmm. So if you plot a graph from December 2017 to date, that is correct. Small and mid cap has been beaten down. But if your starting point is 2014, mm -hmm. then both are almost at par, large cap versus small and mid cap. Uh, and again, some of the falls were driven by governance issues in the small and mid-cap space. So not every fall in stock is an opportunity. One has to be selective about what one buys. Okay. The other question is when I look at your holdings, large, I mean the larger holdings in your portfolio, in the India portfolio at least, uh, maybe you could, if you want, you could speak about some of the global holdings as well because I think people would want to get a flavor of what kind of companies are you looking at. But when I look at the Indian portfolio, there is a bent towards uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, some rate sensitive elements too because you have uh, via some of your largest holdings a direct or an indirect exposure to interest rate movements, autos, financials, a holding company which has got financial name within itself, all of that. Uh, do you think uh, that is something that has worked for you and therefore you would continue doing it? Would you enhance it? Would you bring it down? How, how are you approaching that? Yes, you're right that we have increased uh, exposure to autos within the last 12 months. So uh, Hero Motor Corp is something we added to our portfolio in the last year. And uh, Suzuki, the Japanese company, which is effectively uh, participation in Maruti in India. So these two were added in the uh, last 12 months. Uh, 
has it worked for us? Not yet, because uh, auto still has uh, to see recovery. Mm. But we have bought it from a three to five year kind of perspective. Uh, when we purchased, we clearly knew that near term is very, very gloomy with all the BS6 uh, introduction with uh, slow GDP growth and excess inventory at dealer levels and all of those factors. So we have clearly bought it f with a slightly longer uh, horizon. The remaining uh, portion, which is financial services, uh, HDFC Bank and uh, the Bajaj uh, holding exposure is largely uh, a consumer lending kind of thing, which is not that rate sensitive or cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, the investment in things like uh, ICICI Bank and Access were uh, made because we saw that the NPA cycle was close to ending. So these have turned the corner in my opinion and even the stock prices are reflecting that fact. Okay. Um, one last question on the Indian piece before we move on to maybe the global piece as well because that's such an integral part of your portfolio. Um, when you have such a high weightage in say a, a company like HDFC Bank and this is not a, a call from you in any fashion, not a recommendation. I'm just trying to understand the rationale here. Is it trying to uh, kind of also, also live up to the uh, fact that uh, you, you by virtue of having HDFC Bank at such a high percentage, you get exposure to the uh, financial space in a big way or is it um, a bottom-up call that irrespective of what weightage it had, the business is so good that it will give you the returns that you want. I'm just trying to understand the rationale for owning such a, such a high piece in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a financial name. Sure. So our view on private sector banks has been positive for a while. Uh, these are still about 30 35% of the overall uh, market. So PSUs are still about two-thirds of the overall banking space. Now, they have had issues in terms of their uh, past bad loans. Further, even banks which are doing well periodically get saddled with uh, mergers where they have to absorb the uh, banks which are not doing so well and then they go through the integration issues and uh, things like that. If we say India will grow at 5, 6, 7% GDP and if inflation is going to be 5, 6% kind of thing, in nominal terms, we will be growing at anywhere uh, 10, 12% kind of thing and that one would expect to be the growth in the banking sector in terms of money supply and all. Plus, if private sector players can gain market share of one or two percentage points, uh, now that would be a good growth on the balance sheet side. Mm. Also, these are the players which are benefiting from distributing mutual funds, from selling life insurance policy, from selling foreign currency to travelers and uh, all those kind of things. So all in all, it's a good business. The main risk in this space is on the lending side. Now, anyone who has a great track record of doing well on the lending side and where the credit culture is very, very strong, I think deserves the premium that HDFC Bank gets. So that is one. Now, there are other players with good credit culture. So you would see things like Kotak Bank or Bajaj, etc. They don't have that much of a benefit of low cost deposits. So HDFC Bank not only is great on the lending side, their CASA and uh, given that they pay nothing on current accounts and three and a half on savings account, that also it's a positive. So, all in all, weightage is reflective of the quality of the business that they have. Okay, interesting. Now, on, on to the global piece. Uh, your buying has, as you mentioned, been bottom-up and not necessarily driven by trends. Uh, where is your maximum exposure in terms of geographies? And are you picking and choosing businesses to stick with them for the really long term? Or are you, I mean, are you fairly active? In your past, what has been? Is it been, the last one year, have you been fairly active in terms of churning as well because of the way the markets have been? Or are these really long term bets that will uh, last despite what happens to market conditions on the global front? Well, these are really long term plays. So sales are very, very rare, uh, both in the Indian portfolio as well as in the global portfolio. Not that we haven't sold. Once in a while, we do have a sale transaction. But the larger holdings have been there for a long time, uh, especially the top holding, which is Alphabet, Stroke, Google. 
uh, it's been around 10 percent and it's been there almost since inception. 10 percent of the foreign holding or 10 percent of the overall portfolio? Overall portfolio. 10 percent of the overall portfolio. Yes. Okay. So that is one large holding that we have. Amazon is a more recent addition. So uh, it was a miss in the earlier days. Uh -huh. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, late arrival there. But uh, Buffett missed it too. So Mr. Yeah. Buffett missed it too. <laughs> so to our credit, we bought before Berkshire <laughs> did. So <laughs> maybe some brownie points come our way for that. But essentially, we understood the traction that their cloud business is uh, getting. And uh, that's where uh, we purchased Amazon. Uh, Facebook has been there for a while now. Uh, we bought it, then the stock crashed after the Cambridge Analytica issues. We bought some more and now again it's at all time high. So it gave a scare in between. But uh, the underlying business was good throughout the controversy. So uh, actually it was good in the way that it gave a buy buying opportunity at lower prices. Okay, but most of your holdings are also long term in nature out there as well. You're yes. not quite looking to actively churn. No, we are not things. looking at churning in any meaningful okay. way. Okay. One last question. Uh, you've, how much uh, are you sitting on any kind of cash or have you sat on any kind of cash in the last 12 months? Do you take those cash calls or do you typically remain fully deployed? As on date, we would be around 11% in uh, cash plus arbitrage. Uh, at peak, uh, this was in 2017-18, we were as high as 30%. Wow. Are you sitting on 11% because you deployed cash and therefore that has come off or are you actively increasing cash stroke arbitrage because you're waiting for opportunities? We have not increased actively. We have in fact been deploying over a period of time. Again, at most times we would have roughly 5% cash because that would take care of the inflows outflows uh, and we would not have to uh, disturb the core portfolio too much. So uh, another 6% to deploy, I would look at it that way. Okay, well, we wish you all the best for that deployment. But uh, so great much. work in 2019, Rajiv. And although one is not the best way to analyze funds, but it certainly um, shows that you've done well. And we wish you all the best for doing well in 2020 as well. Thank you so much, Neeraj. Thank right. you so much. That's, uh, well, PPFS uh, with their flagship scheme, which is uh, in the multi-cap category, which has been amongst the best performers uh, in the whole of 2019. Thanks so much for watching. Next week, we'll come back with uh, another fund manager whose scheme would have done well and try and get, as I said, in the belly of the fund to try and tell you what is it that has worked for that fund in 2019 and what it could do in 2020. Thanks so much for watching the Mutual Fund Show. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint.